Our mission is to promote the enjoyment and conservation of North Carolina's native plants and their habitats through education, cultivation, and advocacy. So I can never remember all of that. So I just remember the three P's, preservation, and um, pollen. Uh, our website, um, ncwildflower.org, and we've got, um, I'll talk about what we offer, our organization offers at the end of the presentation. <clears throat> so what makes a plant a native plant? Uh, plants are considered native if they uh, originated and were established in our region prior to the colonization. Uh, native plants eating local people and wildlife for thousands of years before they were ever named native plants. They were just known to people. Animals have evolved together over thousands of years, so the nutritional value of the plants equally matches what the wildlife, the local wildlife needs. And that's what we call plant pollinator mutualism. Um, so, the mutualism of These are not native. They were brought here about the time of colonization, and they have adapted well to this area, and um, they don't seem to um, discern which are native or non-native, but they, they, um, they just look for the high pollen and high nectar plants. How do we know which plants were here before colonization? We have the fossil record. Um, there's, we have the father gila, and these are uh, ancient fossils that the geologists have found. And we also have the um, early Amer um, colonist botanists. They came over from Europe, and um, although the Native Americans knew all the plants, they were classified and identified by the um, Europeans in given Latin names so that that makes them unique in the taxonomy. What we consider our native plant range goes all the way to Texas and north um, up the coast. These, this is the southeast, basically. That's uh, the plants that grow well in this area, and those are the ones we promote. The Piedmont region, we have three North Carolina well, we have several, actually four. We have the mountains, we have the Piedmont, the sand hills, and the coastal plain. So our region is Piedmont, and uh, we're right there, um, almost in the middle. So our soil is um, clay, we have dry summers, the, and flat terrain, basically. So the plants that grow in the Piedmont don't necessarily grow in the coast and they don't necessarily grow in the mountains either. Why are native plants important? As I mentioned, they maintain the local diversity. So from uh, plants the in, uh, that the insects need and the uh, uh, herbivores eat, uh, they feed the food web. Uh, it's a, it's, it feeds the cycle of life, and as I mentioned, the nutritional value of the plants 
are um, in sync with the native wildlife and the um, insects that live here. Why are native plants important? Sources of medical food, and many of which have been forgotten or have not yet been discovered. So we have our, um, we know about echinacea, people take that as an immune system booster. Mountain mint is used in teas. Uh, black willow, uh, willow was, is used as, um, has salicylic acid in it, which is aspirin. And um, spice bush, which grows in the mountains, contains benzoin. Benzoin is a, um, is a solvent. Uh, so, these were first used by the colonists um, for their, their various uses. Some have been uh, synthesized by the companies, so that that's why we, uh, so they have products that uh, they're not so dependent on so many natives, otherwise they'd have to grow, they'd be growing uh, lots and lots of natives just for um, their value. So, um, but the value originally was found in these plants. And third, why are native plants sense of place? So they maintain beauty that make our North Carolina home a very special place. So you wouldn't want to go to um, uh, well, when, when people come to North Carolina, you want them to see the native plants here, the things that grow here, the oaks and the um, sassafras and the uh, spice bush and the things that are native. So, so where are we? This is a beautiful Japanese garden but it's in the United States. It's a gorgeous garden. I have no um, problem with uh, these plants uh, and they add to the landscape. But to American wildlife, they don't recognize these as being food plants. Um, so they, they may provide some honey and some provide seeds. Uh, some become invasive because they, they don't originate here and um, that's what we, we want to promote natives that um, proliferate as well as uh, any of the decorative plants. So non-native plants has impacts to North Carolina native plant diversity. The exotic species were imported uh, from other continents in order to solve some problems. Uh, kudzu was imported as, I think, cattle feed. Uh, autumn olive uh, is, a, is a nice landscape plant, but um, once it escapes from your yard, uh, it can become invasive. Uh, Japanese honeysuckle, that's on our uh, most uh, invasive list. They're not even allowed to sell it, really, in North Carolina. It takes over the trees and bushes and it crowds out the native plants. And of course, English ivy, I think everyone's seen what English ivy can do to a tree over several years. Other impacts to North Carolina native plant diversity are some of the pests and pathogens that have um, uh, come along with the plants that were not known, you don't know them until they're here already and they start uh, making problems. So the chestnut blight fungus, um, the, uh, everybody knows about chestnuts, you, you can't grow a, a full-size chestnut tree anymore. Um, and they have not uh, yet found uh, a way to wipe out the the blight. They are, um, there's some new strains that are genetically modified to resist the fungus, um, but it remains to be seen. I mean, 
they're just saplings right now. So it'll take a long time before we know can, if they can grow to maturity. The woolly adelgid, um, this is the reason you see hemlocks in the mountains that are uh, bare and uh, they look like skeletons. So the woolly adelgid has uh, really um, devastated a lot of the hemlocks in, our, um, in North Carolina. Uh, the emerald ash borer, this is fairly new. This is an Asian beetle they found that um, it's more, it's, so far it's more invasive up north, but uh, it makes these little D-shaped holes in ash trees. And ashes um, are great trees. They use them for, they used to use them for baseball bats and uh, they're great building trees because they grow straight and tall. So um, they have, um, we have to keep an eye out for the emerald ash. And Dutch elm disease, Dutch elms um, that really grew, and they were one of the uh, most um, Once the American elms uh, elm disease takes effect, it spreads by root. So once um, you have a, a tree infected, you have to dig big trenches to separate those roots from the other trees if you want to save your other trees. And these are common favorites in our Asian. <coughs> A couple of these came from Europe. So um, these, some of these are pretty benign plants like camellias um, and peonies. Some are um, pretty troublesome or becoming troublesome like the Bradford pear. Uh, it, it's escaped from uh, landscaped yards and now it's um, it's pretty, it's settling out in the wild and you can, in the spring, you can see all the flowering Bradford pears in the woods and um, that's because the birds eat the little uh, pears and spread the seed wi uh, far and wide. Um, butterfly bush is an Andina, uh, Ligustrum, they're all still old and to uh, so they sold me they said yeah this is dogwood well it takes a small sapling to bloom and by the time it bloomed it was pretty good size but it wasn't native it it was a kusa dogwood which is which is Japanese so um, a big disappointment after waiting all those years. Plus, um, the Coosa dogwood does not have any um, real nutritive value for the local wildlife. So, but after 10 years, it's so big I couldn't even move it anymore. So I had to just cut it down. Um, most of the azaleas that we're familiar with, the evergreen azaleas, those are uh, Asian as well. We do have some very beautiful flame azaleas, which I'll uh, talk about when I go through the plant list. So to be sure you're getting the native plant that you want, you, you must look for the Latin name. So we're not being snooty when we talk about in terms of Latin names.
three years to you didn't really want. Garden grow. Uh, what direction the sun comes up if you're uh, what how much sun you get full shade or part shade is your soil moist or dry do you um, need nutrients um, the master gardeners association which several members are here uh, little kit um, they have little paper cups you can do a soil sample scoop your soil in to the to Raleigh to North Carolina state group and they'll analyze if you're growing blueberries you might Only four. Uh, worker bees gather the the neck. Uh, oh, double bloom or double flowers, like they have extra petals. Uh, I think some flocks are like that. And um, don't just bloom no, no, those are, um, there's another name for that. Uh, the
a meadow and to cover. Um, you, they uh, they spread rapidly, and they're really uh, a, a really a delightful and pretty flower for spring. Foam flower. This is actually a shade flower, but it is an early bloomer, and it does attract. Uh, it does. Um, have more nectar and attracts the pollinators. It is a great landscaping plant. It really looks nice in uh, like your home landscape. Uh, ground cover flocks. Um, there's two kinds. One is uh, woodland flocks, which is shade. Uh, it, a little bit of sun is, doesn't hurt it. it uh, it's long blooming. It has beautiful blue flowers. Um, and we have carpet phlox. Um, it blooms in the early spring, and it can also bloom later in the year, in the fall, when it's cooler. Uh, it's a great ground cover. It's uh, very short. Uh, now it takes full sun and, dr and drought condition. So it's a great plant for a dry bank that's out in the sun. Eastern columbine. And I want to mention, I have, I've brought some seed packets that are in the back. Um, there's different kinds, and columbine is one of them. It, this, is, this is a very pretty flower, uh, so it's great for the landscape, but it's also great out in the fields. Full sun to part shade, uh, blooms mid-spring. Mid um, you can see the stamens. Um, hang out from the flowers so they can get at the pollen readily. Green and gold is uh, another spring bloomer. Full sun to part shade. It's uh, a great flower for walkways and edges. And it likes moisture. So if you have like a moisture, uh, moist spot, uh, it's, it's a great plant for, and it, um, uh, it will crowd out weeds. It, it grows that thickly. Bee balm, uh, Monarda. Uh, They have some bloom. Um, they're a um, pretty copious nectar This is most of them in the fall. This one It has multiple um, spots 
for the bee to collect nectar. And it comes in bulbs or you can, it'll propagate by seed. Blue mist flower is, um, it blooms, it's got a long blooming season. It's short, uh, it's a good landscape flower. It loves moisture. It has those fuzzy heads that the insects love. Butterfly weed, uh, everybody's probably familiar with the butterfly weed being the host plant for monarchs along with the um, milkweed. This is uh, one of the milkweed varieties actually. Um, it blooms in late summer. Uh, it's, it grows fairly tall, three to four feet. It's a sun, it loves the sun. Um, but it's not just butterflies that it feeds. It, it is a nectar producer that bees like as well. Joe pie weed. Uh, you'll see this along the roads and, and along the um, side of the roads in ditches. Uh, it blooms late summer, early fall. Um, if you've ever been to Daniel Stowe or the UNC Botanical Gardens, um, when they, when they bloom, they're just covered with those little skipper butterflies. Uh, but all pollinators love these flowers. And um, the normal Joe pie weed grows very tall, uh, as tall as seven feet, but there are smaller versions as well. Purple coneflower, which is an old favorite. Uh, it grows three to four feet tall. Blooms midsummer, very drought tolerant. Um, it is a pollinator favorite, and when the uh, petals fall off, the seed heads uh, can be left throughout the winter to feed the birds. Sunflowers are very important to all pollinators, including honeybees. Uh, it is a compound flower, so you see the um, See the complex design in the seed head. It's, it's um, people who are what they call the Fibonacci sequence, and it makes that beautiful design of the seed heads. All sunflowers have that. Um, you can see it. And it's called a compound flower because each of those. Um, because it has multiple flowers. Each of those seeds was once a flower. And this is, sunflowers are one of the most favorite of pollinators because they can make, it's like one stop shopping. They can hit a lot of flowers and, and get a lot of pollen and nectar uh, in one stop. There uh, are quite a few, most, of, most sunflowers are um, native to the Americas. The ones mentioned here are uh, perennials, and uh, they are they are native to the southeast. We have Jerusalem artichokes; those are sunflowers. Schweinitz is a is unique to uh, the, this. Actually, uh, very rare. This is another These fall, and um, one of the final um, flowers that pollinators know to look for, as, and especially the migrators. Uh, 
it gets about 12 to 18 inches. These can grow in shade. Um, they, they off, you can often see them growing in the woods. Um, and they spread by seed as well. Calico aster. These like shade or sun, uh, like the white wood aster, they uh, propagate very easily by seed. I have brought some of, some of the seeds uh, of calico aster. They get one to four feet tall. They can be trimmed into uh, nice looking shrubs, low, low shrubs, and they, are, they bloom from August way into late November. Goldenrod is a uh, um, pollinator's golden treasure. It's um, one of the um, most favorite of pollinators uh, feeding plants uh, for all bees. So um, there's many different types. Uh, some are very tall, some are short and fit well into the landscape. Um, they also, um, they are very striking in the landscape when you have like the ironweed blooming and the purple asters, uh, the gold and the, and the purple, uh, make a wonderful combination. So we're going to talk about native herbs. These are all the, na all the herbs, all herbs. Uh, native herbs are, um, I'll go through some of the types here. They usually bloom mid through late summer. They're fragrant. Um, they're used in cooking. Uh, we have Georgia mint, clinopoe, the anise hyssop, um, which is kind of tastes like licorice. So when you, I like to taste these all these different leaves, and uh, and they smell great too. Uh, we also have uh, two different kinds of mountain mint. There's hoary mountain mint. Um, they're pollinator favorites again. They're edible, great ground covers. We have the short tooth mountain mint uh, that makes a wonderful tea. If you have a cold, it's, it's the um, aroma is great for your nose. We have flowering sage. Uh, we have lyre leaf sage. Um, this grows up in many yards and uh, people think it's a weed. Um, Usually, if they if you put out weed and feed, it will um, it will kill it. Um, uh, wide leaves like the other weeds, um, but it's a pretty plant. And scarlet sage, uh, that's that is um, scarlet sage is an annual, but it is it blooms profusely for a long period of time, and uh, it, it reseeds itself pretty readily. Okay, now we're going to talk about shrubs. Uh, shrubs are really great for the honeybee landscape because they don't get too tall and um, block out the sun, but they are usually profuse bloomers. Most of these are, are big bloomers and uh, feed lots of pollinators and are sought after. So button bush is um, if you go in creeks and wetlands, you usually will see a button bush here. And it's usually covered by butterflies and bees and uh, pollinators. It has those um, big round button fuzzy flowers. And again, that's one of those that every one of those little stamens is an individual flower. So it's one of those one-stop shopping flowers. Blueberries. Um, who doesn't like blueberries? They grow mostly in full sun. They can take some shade. They're, if you want to land, landscape your home, there are dwarf varieties that do really well for fall color. Um, they're an early bloomer, and um, they, the flowers are big enough that the bee can get his head inside to get American Beauty Berry. Uh, look at the long stamens on that. that um, there's plenty of pollen available. Um, they grow very fast. Um, in fact, they usually have to be cut back 
in the fall because but you cut them back and then they come back bushy in the spring. They have pretty, pretty, they have, they have great fall color uh, and, and those purple berries are uh, very attractive to migrating birds. So when the berries turn purple, the leaves usually turn light yellow or light green. It's a striking plant for the landscape. Dwarf witch alder. And um, you don't see this very as often. Uh, you can go, you can find this at nurseries. Uh, it does not grow very tall. These are uh, fruit plants that um, you that will fit well in more open areas. Some of these are might be too large for like just a regular um, plot. to part shade these fall color uh, uh, into the winter so it, it's a great wildlife feeder Um, and used in arrangements as well as um, tall varieties. Our native azalea and you see these gorgeous Flame, flame through. Failures. Them like shade. Or, uh, great shade. This is a very late blooming. It can start blooming November and all through winter. So um, this um, this was used as a medicinal plant. I, I still see witch hazel in, in the drugstore. Uh, it's a part shade, um, part sun plant. It's, um, it grows in the margins. It's called a marginal type shrub where the sun, um, where, the, where the forest starts and the meadow stops. That's where you'll find the witch hazel. Service berry, this is another uh, native fruit that um, it's a wonderful thing to have. It's, um, I don't see as many, and uh, it's, it's one we want to get the word out that it's a, it's a wonderful plant to have for pollinators and uh, even because fruit is sweet. Sucker, it's a warm, fuzzy look that the pollinators uh, are drawn to. Another 
wonderful plant to have. It has those huge flower heads. Get pollinated, you have um, you have great fruit that's uh, edible for um, by everybody. I think I've been seeing elderberry syrup. It's additive now. The wetland. They bloom in the early summer. They need some sun, uh, but they can um, some they can bloom in part sun as well, and they're a great uh, shrub for the landscape. Well, they probably they're not as good for um, like around your home because they do they're pretty vigorous suckers. So uh, once you have a clump of them, the clump just gets bigger and bigger, and plus they have. So this is more of a, um, if you want to cover a big area. Viburnums, uh, many wonderful viburnums. Um, arrowwood and black haw are some of the most popular and the ones you'll usually find in nurseries. Again, great fall color. Uh, the berries are eaten by wildlife. I don't, I don't think they are eaten by people. But they also have the big flower heads that are um, easily accessible for pollinators. Tree, so this is going to grow. Um, but it is also a wonderful. Apparently, that it's it's hard to gather enough um, or have enough, uh, or search. I found it was pretty. This is our native dog. It, it really out there for um, looking for food and pollen. It's one of the top ten plants. Wood, but. to full sun. Tree for the landscape. Magnolias. Some are very large. And the um, pollen is uh, a real pollinator magnet. It's beautiful. Magnolia is also this real Out the extent of where it can be found in the wild. Favorite. Here. The, the warm for.
grow more more readily in the mountains. A bit too warm and dry. Or cherry. Uh, this can grow very tall. Uh, blooms April to May. Full sun to part shade. Um, this is one of the uh, early fruiters that birds are looking for. Uh, they're, uh, once all the fall um, seeds and things have gone, the earth flowers are very attractive to Thing. This is the plant that's flavoring. Your plants, uh, they're growing. <laughs> they're bit, they get very. Blooms in the spring, in early spring. So um, that's one that, another one that pollinators look for um, as, uh, as early as February. Wonderful pollinator. Um, it blooms April to May. Great fruit for wildlife. Happens a few grapes at a time. I don't think there's a way to predict which plant produces which type. Male, they have to have if the flower is perfect. Have to put all the, um, wonderful native plants in your garden. It's time for yourself and enjoy it, and um, because you're part of nature as well. You want to relax and enjoy nature's beauty. And it's also a really good idea to keep a record of what you've planted where, how it grows, and uh, nutrients that you've added from time to time. Bikes in uh, special areas. Uh, um, uh, early spring bloomers. Uh, we have several groups that plant rescue of development if there's some valuable plants. plants uh, we have a searchable database for for all plants um, <clears throat> we there's a we have a sort of certificate plant garden that you can apply for 
and uh, get a certificate for your yard to be a native plant um, host. And uh, we have a contact list of native plants providers. Uh, one of the handouts, um, well, it's not a handout, it's, it's just a sheet of local native plant providers. If you have a cell phone, you can take a picture of it. Uh, we also maintain a list on our website of of different growers that specialize in native plants. The Southern Piedmont Mont chapter meets the second Sunday of each month. Uh, sometimes we meet at a hike site and sometimes we meet at Reedy Creek Park if it's cold and uh, have a we have a presentation. So for more information, um, this is our Southern Piedmont chapter email for um, just ask for the newsletter because everything's in there or to just to get on our email list. Um, resources, uh, these are some wonderful books that I used in my research. Um, and here's some websites that you can pursue for information. and photo credits. All right. Do we have any questions? Are all these plants native to North Carolina? All the ones I talked about, yes. They can be found in different areas. Now, some are uh, found in the wild in maybe the coastal area versus the Piedmont, but they'll grow in the Piedmont if you uh, They'll, they'll grow uh, different, if they're in, within the right zone, you can grow them uh, readily. Now some, like mountain plants, um, look at the climate. Uh, okay, yes. I brought down some columbine from our farm up in Michigan. Now, wow. is, uh, it's growing very well down here. Is, is that a problem? Is it not native then if it's from Michigan? Well, the, the actually, Slide here. Yeah, you have a picture. Yeah, so if that's the one you brought, then yes, those grow native. Um, Colorblinds are great plants and non aggressive, so, you know, uh, I have no problem with You discourage. Yes? Chokebird, aren't they edible? They can be if you add a lot of sugar. <laughs> you can, yeah, there's chokeberry jelly, uh, but uh, I mean, that's, that's why they're, I mean, I've eaten one and they're real sour, but yeah, they, they are edible, definitely, if you add enough sugar. Yes, in the back. I found some of the very easy to grow and birds and some seeds that I have. Uh-huh. If you large seed heads, those are annual. Western and and maybe South America, those large seed heads, they're fine. I mean, the the sunflowers. listed on our, our plant list back every year. They grow in clumps. And the cl it, did I answer your question? 
Okay. Oh, I see what you mean. It's fine. Uh, you mean like the black oil seed? Yes. Uh, the black oil seed will sprout. Um, I don't, it, it, um, well, I don't know what the black oil seed produces, but uh, no, those aren't, those probably are not native. They probably ship those from uh, Europe. But uh, you can, I mean, you can plant them. They, those are annuals as well. They, they're not perennial, but uh, they do, yeah. They, grow fast. they do grow fast. So, I mean, they're fine. And honeybees will like them because, you know, they're, even if they're not native, so uh, they're fine. But, um, yes. Oh, I know. Yeah. It's hard. So, uh, yes. They do clump, yes. Once you, uh, you can plant seeds, but um, it's probably easier to buy a plant and just let it clump and get bigger and bigger. Yeah, and they love moisture, so um, yeah, they, they'll come up every year. They usually start coming up around June and the flowers. me and uh, I do encourage uh, you to go native. Thank you.